time we wound up talking about instrumental reason. I want to go over this one more time. So Hobbes, as we saw in this crucial passage on pages 28 to 29 of us, chapter 6, paragraph 7, Hobbes says that when people use the terms good and evil, what they mean by that is simply a reflection of their own desires and aversions. And he's explicit that um, there's nothing in an object itself which makes it intrinsically good or bad. And so whenever we use those terms, good or bad, we're using them relative to the speaker, relative to somebody who has desires and aversions. Um, so, so our ends um, are um, things that we have, as it were, desires for. So for Hobbes, that just means that we are attracted to, acquire. Um, and these are the things that we call good. So I want to say one more time, there's nothing in the object itself that makes it good objectively. It's simply a, the use of the term good is simply a relational term, something about a speaker's attitude toward that thing. Which means that an assessment of value here for Hobbes is always going to be relative to a subject, relative to somebody's desire. So our ends so our ends are given simply by the desires that we find ourselves with. Um, and what this means in the first instance, is that there's no rational assessment of our ends. They are simply subjective and not subject to rational criticism or evaluation. There's no question to be asked about whether those things that we desire, those things that we call good, really are good. There's no further question about whether our desires are getting at the way things really are. There's no objective property of goodness independent from a subject. So I say again, uh, there's no rational assessment of our ends. There's no rational assessment of the value that we place on our ends. So as long as somebody has a desire, as long as, in fact, they <coughs> desire some end, some good, some goal, some objective, as long, that is, as long as their behavior is toward that thing, that's what it means to desire, as long as there is that fact that they try to acquire that or achieve that end, then it is good to them, for them. So it's just a fact that they have the desire or not, and there's no rational assessment of that any more than there is any rational assessment of any other causal process. So there's no like rational assessment of an aversion either. That's correct. Of course. Okay, so is that part clear? Alright. But this can't be the whole story. And it can't be the whole story of Hobbes' account of value. This is his account of sort of the foundation of value. But there has to be more to it than that. And that's because once we've established what somebody has a desire. Once we've established that they call something good, there's no rational assessment of that. It's just a fact. They move toward it or away from it in the case of the bird. So once we've established that fact, that they would call something good, then we can, we may, we are able to 
to assess and evaluate whether they are rational in how they're pursuing that end. That good. So this is because the pathways, the causal paths through the world to achieve some end, this is an objective matter. Right? Whether doing one thing will cause something else to happen, that's not just a subjective feeling. There's a fact of the matter. This is, this is what science studies. Which causal pathways bring about which ends. So we can make rational assessments of the means that somebody takes toward their end. We can say that they're taking they're taking a rational path, they're taking a rational means, given that they have a certain end, or that they're being irrational in how they go about trying to achieve their end, what they did. So we can make objective, rational assessments of the means that somebody takes once we've established what their end is. Once we've established that their some goal is something they have a desire for, they take to be good. No rational assessment of that. But once we've set that, then we can make an evaluation and say they're doing it well or poorly in how they pursue that end. Because prudence, you remember, I think I said at the end last time, it's on page 40, is the knowledge of these causal patterns. Is that clear? Questions about that? So think about it this way. Um, <clears throat> the desires that we happen to have make things good from our point of view. That's, as it were, purely subjective. There's no question in that. It depends on what the subject happens to desire. Um, but then once those ends, once those goods, those values are set by the desires somebody has, then we can say that certain means are good or bad. We can evaluate the means in a kind of objective way relative to the subjective ends that the, that the agent has. Is that clear? Any questions about that? So, uh, this, so this is an instrumental conception of rationality. Um, and I want to say again um, that we're not, we, human beings, are not all always rational. So this is strictly about, for Hobbes, strictly about the means that we take to our end, not the ends, which are not subject to rational assessment simply whether we take the pro proper means once our ends have been set. So we're not always rational. That is, sometimes we choose the wrong means, the objectively wrong means, to our end. Questions about that? Right, this, is, this is important, so if it's not clear, you need to let me know. We can evaluate the means, but not that. We can evaluate means for a person <coughs> once we've set, once we've established what their ends are. And this, I want to, I want to emphasize that this is an evaluation we're making. We, we can say the person is doing this poorly, or we can say this person is doing it well. We can say this person is being rational or this person is being irrational. But when we say that, we have to be aware that we're, as it were, taking for granted what their ends are. What if it's an irrational means, but they get to the end? Um, maybe they're lucky. 
right? So that um, uh, we could say that I mean, this is all sort of these, these evaluations are all sort of forward looking. So that we have an end, we do the best that we can in figuring out what causal path will bring us to that end. Well, we're fallible, so sometimes we make mistakes, sometimes we get it correct. Um, so if, if a certain causal pathway typically brings about a certain end, somebody desires. But in this case, it doesn't. Well, I mean, so this increases our knowledge. Right? We learned, maybe, that we may learn in what circumstances it fails to bring about that. In other words, we learned something, of, we learned something about science. Right? We learned something about which causal pathway brings about what. Last chance. Okay. Okay, so according to Hobbes, we'll see him say this explicitly in a little while, but it's clear enough now, there's obviously not an objective form of the good life. There's not a single ideal um, of what a good life would consist in that we are all in agreement of. Um, now, on the older, what I called before, teleological tradition, maybe I'll say, uh, maybe I'll use a new word that some of you might be help, uh, familiar with, a eudaimonistic tradition. Um, on this older tradition, typically the approach to morality was, and justice, was to treat morality and justice as somehow part of the, what a good life consists of. So somehow or other, morality or justice constituted part of the objective end that we were all properly striving for. Now, of course, not everybody realized this.